purpose of this space is to create a very safe environment for people to share a moment of their lives. Tagpuan sa 104 and 138 na may higit sa tatlong daang sasakyan, brand new and pre-owned, ay pwede niyong pagpipilian. Bago ka pa sa bansa, wala ka pang credit score, walang problema. Marami kaming selection from all makes and models and all trade-ins are welcome. Higit pang informasyon sa surimitsubishi.com Located one block north of St. Paul's Hospital, Downtown Denture Center features complete and partial teeth restoration options. With 35 years experience, Anthony Chung offers mobile services and emergency repair consultation 24 hours a day. Downtown Denture Center, just off Nelson at 970 Burrard in the lobby of the Electra Building. Foodie World has 75,000 square feet of imported and domestic products with a large selection dedicated to our Filipino kababayans with an in-house butcher, variety of seafood, and produce from around the globe. Open every day until midnight. Foodie World, one block east of Number 3 Road off Sea Island Way in Richmond. Centrally located in the Richmond Auto Mall since 1984, Richmond Honda features a large selection of Honda certified pre-owned vehicles Inside the showroom, Honda's newest models are displayed for viewing, and the dealership is staffed seven days a week for financial consultation. All the stories that you're going to hear tonight are personal in nature, some of which can encroach on dark topics as addiction, abuse, self-harm, and you may get triggered by them. And if you do, there is a beautiful lounge to the back of XY that you can go down, chill out, get your composure. When you're ready, you can come and join us. Welcome to my story. My, name's, my name is Winston Young, and I'll be your host for tonight. That's my favorite part of the, the whole show right there. I appreciate the fact that you've given up a beautiful day outside to come inside an air-conditioned room to have some beverages and listen to me rant on for uh, the next 90 minutes. <laughs> so May 3rd, 2013 happened, and I had to choose, and I, I chose to change. And I wish to tell you that it was all rainbows and unicorn farts, but it wasn't. It was. It was difficult. I, I thought I was in shape. I was lying to myself that I was in shape. That Saturday, my friend dragged me into the gym, and that became, became the first step into a really long journey where uh, I'm looking at her, you know, <laughs> being very judgmental. I say, oh, I'm looking at that girl. She's doing all this stuff. I could do that right. I was full of shit that I could do half of that. And then I became humbled. But along this journey, along the way, because I had to hold on to the belief that this was going to work. I had to hold on to the belief that if I just kept going, things would change. And then one day a sequence of events happened that led me into a exper experimental, experimental workshop. And I walked into those doors on June 17th, 2016. And I had no idea what was going to happen walking through those doors. But one thing that did happen was I was given a new definition for forgiveness. And that was simply, forgiveness is letting go of the possibility of a different past. That was it. As simple as that sounded, but the minute I heard those words echo in my head, all the walls that I built started to shake, and they started to come down. And I remember sitting there in the chair thinking about those words. And I just had tears coming out of my eyes. I, it was uncontrollable. I had no idea what was going on. 48 hours later, I left 
well, I wasn't there for 48 hours, but two days later when the workshop ended and I walked out of those doors, I knew my life was going to be different. I didn't know what was going to happen though. That being said, I was one of 10 people in that group. I walked out of those doors with 10 brothers. I've changed to come and share this space with you today. And I invite my brother, Lucky Sugan, to the stage to share his transformation. Cowley and Company, car accident lawyers representing personal injury and disability victims in the Lower Mainland. A former chiropractor, Lee Cowley has more than 20 years experience as an attorney in BC. Locations include Abbotsford and Burnaby, with a head office in Surrey, on 104 Avenue at 138th Street. But I'm making a selection from all makes and models, and all trade-ins are welcome. Bago ka ba sa bansa, wala ka pang credit score, walang problema. Garantisad ang financing, plus learn kaming certified warranty technicians for all your services and repairs. Matatagpuan sa 104 and 138 and at surreymitsubishi.com. Hello everyone, how you doing? Good, more energy, come on. <laughs> Good, I wanna say thank you for sharing your story, it really touched me. I wanna acknowledge you for sharing your story today. Thank you. Everyone, my name is Lucky Siwoy. I am a vlogger, plant-based influencer, and Ironman athlete. So I've been sitting back there and debating on how I was gonna start my, my story today. I think I'm gonna start when I was in Los Angeles. Just a little over two years ago, before I met Winston, I was, living in LA, no visa, living off my savings, and just enjoying life. Um, and eventually I did a previous workshop with the same mentor that did the workshop for me and Winston two years ago, and just completely changed my life. I opened up about things that I've been hiding for years, the fact that I think three years before that I wanted to take my life away because I went out of alignment and I just couldn't, I couldn't deal with it. And after opening up about that, that story to all my brothers that were in the room, I decided that it was time for me to build an empire. It was time for me to build something where I could impact other people. And then I looked at my bank account and I had $100 left. And the only flight I could buy was to Vancouver. So I went on social media, I asked who was living in Vancouver, who I knew that was living here. And I had one buddy from Montreal that just moved to Surrey. Uh, so I told him, like, hey man, I'm, I'm coming to your place, and uh, yep, that's pretty much it. So I booked my flight, landed in Vancouver, got to his place, and he had nothing. He was as broke as I was. That $100 for that flight was all I had left. So he had a couch, no blanket, no pillow, and I think for the first two weeks I slept on my backpack with my hoodie on me just to, you know, properly fall asleep. And then I went on Craigslist trying to find jobs, trying to make some money so I could buy, first of all, food uh, and a blanket and a pillow. And after three weeks, I got my pillow and my blanket, which I still have because it's an amazing memory. <laughs> um, and yeah, and I started working my way up. I got a job downtown, so I was taking the train, which if, I don't know if it's okay to say that, but I was jumping the gates for the SkyTrain or walking really close to people because I didn't have no money for the SkyTrain. Um, and yeah, I started, working down there, made a friend, and just made more connections, and eventually started sleeping on different couches. So I think I couched for a full nine months before I was able to save up my money to get my own place. Uh, I think I did like Surrey, New West, Mount Pleasant, downtown, and then Kitsilano, and then Olympic Village for my first apartment. Uh, so it's been an uphill battle since I've been to Vancouver, just working different jobs, working 60 hours a week, working construction, and just making the most of, that I could. And during that time, I never stopped building my social media platforms. I was always making YouTube videos. I was always documenting on Instagram and just sharing my journey with people. And actually, my most viewed video on YouTube is me sitting on one of the couches that I was sleeping and sharing my story. And just like, this is where I'm at. I'm sleeping on this couch. I'm paying $100 to sleep here. I make this much money, and I have a hard time buying money for food. And just, that's why I was the most used, I think, because I was really authentic and sharing people, like, it's not easy. Vancouver's expensive. Coming from the Quebec side originally, rent, rent is a little bit more. <laughs> 
Um, and why I'm sharing this, this progression in, in my journey in Vancouver is because it's always been an uphill battle and I always knew that it wouldn't last forever. And that's the main lesson that I learned when I was gonna take my life away. Um, the reason I didn't do it is just because I heard my dad's voice in my head. Um, and I can't swear on YouTube, but you can bleep it out. Um, he said, don't be a little bitch. That's what I heard in my head. And it was like, don't give up on your problems, you know? Don't, don't quit, there's gonna be better days. And just in that 0.5 seconds, um, when, when I heard his voice, I just understood that if I would have done it, I wouldn't have had my amazing girlfriend, I wouldn't have lived the experiences that I've lived, I wouldn't be able to create the impact that I'm creating today. So me coming here and being like, I'm couch surfing, I don't have money for food, I don't have the connections yet, it's like, that's ah, not gonna last forever. I'll meet someone, someone's gonna know someone, I'm gonna make money, I'm gonna get my apartment. And now fast forward two years later, I'm blessed to live by the beach and do a job that I love. I'm blessed to live off social media and just constantly creating an impact on every single day. And I get to train for a sport that I love. Another um, obstacle slash blessing in a weird way came up in, in my life over a year and a half ago when I met my, my girlfriend. We were dating for three months and then she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, and I knew I loved her and I knew that I was gonna be there for her and that obviously I was gonna stay because I loved her and I wanted to go through this with her. But I also knew that it wasn't gonna last forever. I knew that we would kick cancer's butt and we would get rid of it and that you know, we would get rid of it. And that's why we're still on this journey today. We're kicking ass and we're getting rid of her cancer uh, on a daily basis. Um, yeah. So what I wanted to share with you, the, the point of, of my message today is that even if it sucks, you're in a hard patch, it's not gonna last forever. Things will get better. And no matter, there's nothing like, there's nothing, no matter how low you are. It might last a month, two months, six months, a year, but eventually it'll get better. And those better days will be worth it, will be worth all that, that pain that you went through. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to share. I wasn't too prepared to like fully share my story, but I just wanted to, to get that point across, and that's what I preach on social media is, nothing's gonna last forever, and you can make the most out of it. Oh, actually, I wanna talk about plan base before, before I get off. Yeah, because um, I've talked about this uh, earlier. Um, so I've been vegan for five years, and that's a big message that I'm, that I'm preaching online. Me saying that I wanted to build my empire when I came to Vancouver, I didn't know what my empire was gonna look like. I didn't know what I was gonna talk about, what I was gonna do. And when she got sick and we discovered the importance of nutrition, I was, all, I was already vegan at that point, but I didn't know how much nutrition could actually affect your health and your body. Um, and then we started doing some more research and I started discovering the importance of like fruits and vegetables and what different fruits can do, adaptogens and how they bring down your cortisol level and just the whole array of, of foods that you can eat to heal your body. Um, and <laughs> I'm terrible at story, storytelling. Um, all this to say that I didn't know what I came here to build and life presented opportunities to me that made me discover my passion, made me discover what I want to talk about and what I wanted to help people with. Yeah, thank you. So now it's, we're, we're two years in, three, no, three, three years in, I'm doing the work. I got to reflect and I got to go back in time to key moments that turned me into this dysfunctional, highly operating narcissist for most of my life. One was, I was in high school, uh, I was raised in North Vancouver, one of four Asian people, and it's, it's, it wasn't very culturally diverse back then. And I remember walking into a classroom and the kid looks at me and says, why are you here? You don't deserve to be in this class. Why don't you just get the hell out of here and Go back home. Well, I took that as a challenge to exceed everyone in that class. Example number two, I had a crush on uh, a friend of the family, 
uh, their daughter. They knew I had a crush on their daughter. So one day we're at a family gathering and uh, her father goes, Win Winston's a, a nice guy, he's single, right? So why don't uh, the two of them go out on a date? And my mom goes, him? He's not good enough for your daughter. I'm like, okay. <coughs> so then I went on my way to prove the world that I was good enough. Five years pass, 10 years pass, 15 years pass, and my sister comes up to me and asks, what are you doing? She goes, I go, what do you mean? Why are you doing what you are doing? I'm like, well, I never really thought of that. So we had this really deep talk, really went to the core of this. So I start, what happened was from what, 13 years ago, I started my own company. I quit my job, started my own company, and it's, it's been successful. And then she saw that I was working myself to death, and she didn't want to lose her brother the same way we lost our father. So she asked why I was doing what I'm doing. When, at the end of it, she goes, so you're trying to reach a goal, but you don't know what the goal is. You're trying so hard to strive for something, but you don't know what you're striving for, and you're trying to hear that you've been a good son from two people that are dead. You do understand that this is impossible. I looked her straight in the eye, and I go, yes, and I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> and I could only say that to her because all the rage that I had inside of me was numbed by all that numbing that I did. And I wasn't aware that everything that I built, all this beautiful stuff that I built, at a touch of my finger, I burned it to hell. I wasn't aware. I was just build, 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 burn, burn, burn. Like there's this massive path of destruction that happened. And when I was finally able, by this beautiful soul, where she made me turn around and look, and I saw this path of destruction, and she goes, is that what you want? And I really had to go look at that. And she asked, is that what you want? And I stood there, I remember, I stood there for about 10 minutes, and she just held space. And then she asked, what would you change? And I couldn't answer the question because I didn't understand. And with that, I invite Mark Addy to the stage. So I hope he can give me some insight. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. So my name is Craig Addy, and I'm a musician, and I'm very passionate about being a musician. And this story is how I got to be that passionate. I called this story, um, I called it passion, pain, and play. So let's start with the play. That's the fun part. I mean, I really, I had like a, a miraculous childhood. I mean, how many kids get to grow up in a kindergarten? I grew up in a kindergarten because my mom ran a kindergarten in the basement of our house. And you know, kindergartens in those days, they only went in the morning, and then the place was free for the whole afternoon. So all through my childhood, until I went to school, I had this amazing playground. It had Tinker Toys and Lego, and it had a library of books with like Curious George and Dr. Seuss, four painting easels all ready to go, big buckets of Play-Doh, you name it. I had everything you could imagine. But it didn't end there. You go outside, I didn't have two tricycles to play with. I had a fleet of tricycles to play with. And then beyond that, we literally lived in a forest. If you went up into the backyard, it was a forest with a treehouse and a sandbox and swings. I mean, it was luxurious. And then, of course, there was music, too. We had two pianos in the house, one downstairs and one upstairs. And then later, my mom bought a grand piano. That'll become significant later. And so I just had this incredibly rich life as a child. Sounds perfect, doesn't it? Well, I'm a human being, so even if something's perfect, we'll make it not perfect, won't we? 
But there was this part about pain. So while I had that perfect life, some things about my childhood were not perfect. And one of those was, you know, fitting in with groups. You know, the team sports thing. Hockey was interesting. My parents gave me all those opportunities too. So they put me in hockey. I don't really remember hockey. It was a very short-lived career. But apparently, uh, my mom knew the coach, and she checked in with him. And, and his words were, well, Craig lights it when the, hawk go the, the puck goes into the net, because then he can get it. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't the goalie. Um, and apparently, I really loved the costume. <laughs> so they took me out of hockey, and they put me in soccer. And I stuck with the soccer longer, but I really liked being on the sidelines, because I was afraid of the balls. I mean, I just. It wasn't for me. And then there was Cub Scouts. So my first try at Cub Scouts didn't work too well. I liked the badges, but I didn't really want to do all the work to get the badges. And I guess that wasn't going well, because they took me out and they put me into another Cubs. And that was a little bit better. So all that stuff, you know, it, it wasn't great. You know, I would rather go in the corner and paint. Um, but then when high school came along, it got a little more serious. The, the specter of bullying arrived. So I'm all ready for high school. This is going to be great. There's all these like amazing new things, new teachers, new classes. And I can still remember, right at the beginning of grade 8, I was in what's called English small group. And we were having a discussion. And for some reason, in this small group, there were nothing but boys. And we were having this discussion, and I was really engaged. And I can remember, you know, you know really asking questions and being self-expressed. And the class ended, and I went out into the hall, and I went over to have a drink of water, and I was leaning down having the drink of water, and I hear this voice sneering, oh, Craig's a fag. I didn't even know I was gay. I was gay, but I didn't even know I was gay yet. But that began this, this period of being bullied. And you know, the thing about bullying isn't, I mean, I was never physically hurt. It was the threat of being physically hurt that was scary. The thing about bullying that's horrible is the humiliation and the embarrassment. I was just so embarrassed. So I didn't want anyone to know. I didn't tell my parents. And I lived with this. And I was dealing with you know, coming to terms with the fact that I was gay as well. So all this was on me, and I didn't want to tell anyone. And it was, I was pretty miserable. Well, something happened at the same time. I was taking piano lessons. And up until then, I had loved music, and I was doing fine. But my piano teacher gave me a Chopin nocturne to learn. And that was the first piece of music I'd ever learned that had sadness and, and passion and all those emotions that I was dealing with in it. And that was a safe outlet for me to express all I was going through. And then I also discovered, when I played that piece, that people got the value of that for themselves. And so that, when, that was when my heart was really stolen by music. And so I went on to, to become a musician. And the thing is, um, it's no surprise that I become a very particular kind of musician. I'm particularly interested in the healing and nurturing powers of music, because that's what it did for me. Music really was my savior at a time that was really critical. And so it's no surprise that a lot of the music I play is very meditative and soothing. Not all of it, but a lot of it is. And so I have discovered ways of taking that pain and that play of my youth and the creativity that that fostered to be able to give that to people, to nurture and heal people. And I've discovered some funny ways to do that. One way is that people come, and they crawl underneath my grand piano. Now, this is one of the things I did when I was a child. When my mom was playing the piano, I would crawl under the grand piano. It's the one I have now. And she would be playing beautiful Chopin and Schubert. And the vibrations of the piano would immerse. Your body would be immersed in these vibrations. And it's like, it's like a massage with sound. And then, but like music is the language of emotion. So there's all that emotion that's happening at the same time. So, you know, about 10 years ago, I was in a piano store just trying these amazing pianos, really expensive pianos. And I suddenly had a memory of being that child crawling under the piano. And the, the piano player who was playing this big nine-foot concert grand didn't know me. 
So I said, just keep playing. I'm going to crawl under the piano. And, um, and I did. And I was back in my childhood, and I could feel the vibrations going through my whole body. And I thought, there's something here. I don't know what. So I had some friends over a few days later to see what they thought. So they took turns getting out under my piano, and I just improvised, because I love to improvise. And they're all kind of going, this is not like listening to a piano across the room. It's a whole new world. And one of them said casually, you should do that as a business. So for 10 years, that's what I've been doing. People come, and they lie under my grand piano, and I give them this sound massage. And the thing that really, really is so fulfilling is that I've discovered that it really is a healing experience for people. So I've got to work with some people who are dealing with some pretty heavy stuff. I think one that really stands out is a couple, they had lost their baby. And so they wanted to do something in memory of their baby. So they came with the baby's ashes in a little box, and they got under my piano. And what I do is I recreate people. They share with me what they want to share with me, and I recreate them. I, I spontaneously compose in the moment. And I, I tell you, they, they said after they both independently of each other had the experience of their baby leaving and going to the other world in peace. So that's what I get to do now. And that's what I have. One of the things that I learned out of doing this story is that, you know, I thought if I could go back and get rid of that pain of the bullying, I don't think I would. Because I wouldn't be getting to do what I do now if I hadn't gone through that. Can't say that for sure. But I think probably not. Thank you.